Well, Michael, as you know, I was already a big fan of your seminal debut film, Monster Challenge. Um, so I know this is not your first crack at wearing the baggy director's pants <laughs> or your first tour of duty with Marvel in general. But suffice to say, how did this project come about for you? Uh, it was actually a couple, few years ago, three and a half years ago, maybe. I was talking to Kevin and I was just we were talking about filmmaking and I was saying, oh, I really miss making movies and I want to want to direct something again. You know, uh, and he was like, well, if, if you were going to direct something, what would you want to direct? And I immediately was I said, Werewolf by Night. And he was just like, what? <laughs> wait, I was like, wait, you know, it's one of your comments. He goes, no, I know what it is. But what? <laughs> like, really? That's what you choose? I was like, yeah. I said, I like the things that are like off to the side, the weird stuff, the things that you can really kind of dig your teeth into and do something crazy with. So that started the whole conversation, you know, and it was as pretty as it was like as simple as that. Was there even a story in place no. when you talked to Kevin about that? No, 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 no. There was nothing in place. It was just <laughs> simply like, well, what would we do with it? And, uh, you know, and it was just sort of spitballing different versions of different things. And it, and it grew into, you know, more and more conversations. Um, but the one thing that we we agreed on and we thought would be a great way to go with it, and this was Kevin's sort of, uh, he put this idea forward that we would, let's do it as a special. He goes, because we both loved as, as kids, it was like, you know, when you see that, you know, a special presentation logo come on and you get so excited because you knew you were going to get something different than what was supposed to be on that night. And it was like you were being allowed to gamble. You were a kid who was being allowed to gamble and it was so exciting. So it was just like I thought I thought that was a great way to go with it. And uh, and from that with that, I thought, OK, that's perfect because we can keep it self-contained. We don't have to connect it to a million other things. Let's just tell the story as if we're making an episode of The Twilight Zone. So so that's so all of that just kind of came together. And from there, we rolled into what our story was going to be. Well, I got to admit, you caught me off guard with the, with the fact that the notion of doing Werewolf by Night started with you. So then I'm going to have to call an audible and ask, what was it about that particular property that was so interesting to you? I love monsters. I mean, I love monster movies. I grew up with them. My brother Anthony and I religiously every Saturday would be watching Creature Double Feature outside of, you know, we lived outside of Philadelphia. I'm sure Jeff was the same. I mean, you know, that was the thing about Jeff and I. Jeff and I both loved these things. And we have such a <laughs> such a fond memory and, and place in our heart for a creature double feature that Saturday afternoon thing. And it was, and again, talk about gambling. Like you sat down in front of that television. You didn't know what you were going to get. You might get Vincent Price. You might get a Kaiju movie. You know, you might get the Wolfman. You, you just didn't know. And that was always what was so fun about sitting down and, you know, it being exposed to all of this. Now monsters. Yes. Great. But the thing I really love about monsters is that what they what they what they mean there it's an allegory for someone with an, a problem who needs help you know and that to me was always very interesting because i always thought none of these monsters want to be monsters you know they, they don't ask for this they don't want to go indiscriminately killing people and everything but and and i always felt like it was a cry for help they were always asking for help and no one was ever willing to give it to them <laughs> So I thought like, OK, maybe we have a chance to kind of talk about that side of things. What's it like to be different? What's it like to be other? And what's it like to be um, unique in a, in a society that is that is constantly telling us if you're different, you're bad, you know, and, and and that really bugs me. So so those things all combined, I think, really attracted me to this idea of telling this story. Well, what a fabulous transition to editor Jeff Ford, somebody crying for help. Exactly. Um, no, one, no one will listen. <laughs> Sorry, my life. Well, Jeffrey, you've done, uh, by my accounts, my accounting, five films with Michael. Um, and it comes as no surprise that a couple of them were Marvel movies. Um, but of course, he was the composer on those, not the director. So tell me about, and you know, you're certainly no stranger to Marvel, but tell me about how you two got paired up for this one and what you talked about uh, in pre-production about Werewolf by Night. Well, I actually sought sought him out to do this when he to first told me he was doing it. I'm like, oh my God, can can I do, can I please do it? Because we met many years ago on a movie called The Family Stone, which is uh, which was one of you know uh, my earlier films, and I just loved working on it with director Tom Bazooka, great guy, great film, great spirit, great energy, and it had an we, you know Michael did an incredible score for that movie, really elevated it and turned it into something special, and and just 
every time I've worked with him, he's made my work so much better. Like he's improved. Um, it's made it look like it was properly cut. And, and it's just sort of, I mean, I felt like, Oh my God, I, I, I got it. I, that's like, I, I, dude, I got it. I, I, you, I owe you. <laughs> what, what do you mean? No, I, I, I see. Here's, <laughs> oh, let me, let me, let me just, that's really why I wanted saying, to do it yeah. by the way. <laughs> Let me just add on to what he's saying here, because what he's not saying is that when I sat down to work on the Family Stone, I, Jeff and I didn't know each other, even though we found out really quickly that we had a million connections through other people that we didn't realize. But I sat down on Family Stone. I'm watching this movie and I'm thinking to myself, who edited this? Because it was so perfect. I could just write music. I didn't even have to think about it. Everything hit perfectly. Oh, the rhythm was like so amazing. And I remember just how fun and how freeing it was not to worry about, uh, I got to put a five, four bar here because this cut's not landing right. Or I got to do a tempo change here, which is going to make things. And believe me, that happens a lot, but it never happens with Jeff. And, and, and his, his cuts are some of the easiest cuts I've ever been able to write to. Like, it's just, it's just made for music. It's great. Thank you. That's very nice of you. That's a huge compliment. I, I also, I think part of it is that Michael and I have a similar taste and, and aesthetic yeah. and approach. And, and we're, we're, we all, if you go back and talk about movies that we, that inspired us, you we just sync up. And so that's yeah. like the first point of reference. And you go, well, I learned how to do this from watching Spielberg and I learned how to do this from watching Coppola. And, and like, that's how you uh, because we had the similar the similar background, I think we, we sync up really well. But I uh, anyway, I really wanted to do this because also the chance to work with a friend and and just have fun and make a movie and not feel the whole the pressure of like, well, what, what, I got to prove myself to the director and what does he want and and the, and the director would be like, was this guy and like we had that was all done like we knew each other we'd worked together we, we knew we collaborated well it's like being in a band you know it's if you're, you you sound good together just because it just it's that chemistry so. Uh, I feel like that was just like, how could I pass up the chance to work with a, with a friend and, and us to be, it was literally like being kids making a monster movie. I, I was just going to say <laughs> exactly that. What it, it, was was, like. it was as if we were 12 years old. You should have seen us like <laughs> on set and we were just like behind the monitor and we would be sitting there laughing at, because, you know, they'd be doing the scene and we'd just be having so much fun watching the actors do their thing. We would just be back there laughing. Everyone would be looking at us like, what is wrong with those two? And we're just like, we're having fun. Well, this is supposed to be fun. There's some rule somewhere I think that somebody has that's like you have to be miserable and oh, stressed out and, and having an awful time making movies because they're hard and it's difficult. And, and I'm like, well, no, <laughs> you really don't. And, and not only that, it, 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 the, the, the atmosphere that Michael set on set. And every day that we were shooting, you know, it was so easy and it was so relaxed and it allowed this creative energy to flow. And, and the actors really respond to that. You just, the idea of it not being this sort of drudgery, it was just yeah. a joy. So uh, that was the other reason why I wanted to do it. And it paid off because we actually had every day was like that. It was a blast. And, and they left us alone to do what we wanted to do for a lot of the, <laughs> you know, for, for better or worse, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. it was, you know, it was, but, but, but I think there was so much going on at the time on other shows and everything. And we were sort of li the little engine that could, and, uh, they're like, okay, well they're, they're, they're fine over there. And we were down basically the equivalent of being down in my mom's basement making this thing with no one bothering us except to ask us what we want for lunch right. I, think they, I think they were thinking like what are they what are those guys I don't know what those guys are doing is yeah. so like, I don't know, whatever <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it when they get back we'll see <laughs> you know once you, you you pitched them on hey werewolf by night would be a great thing to do obviously it's that's you joke about, oh, well, we were just in my mother's basement and they don't care. But of course they care. And it's going to be yes. part of the MCU in some way, shape or form. So what did they say to you about um, where Werewolf would, by Night would be in terms of its place in the greater MCU or even creating a new aspect of the MCU? Nothing. <laughs> it was not a conversation at all. It was never like, OK, you guys are doing this. Now, remember, this slots in right here before Iron Man bought this car and and, you know, Spider-Man <laughs> lost his pajamas or something like that. You know, there was there were no conversations about that. And the intent from the beginning was that it was always going to be amorphous as to where it was. We always said, yes, it's in the MCU, but we're not concerned with telling you exactly where, when, hot, well, you know, all of that stuff. It, it wasn't important. What was important was this little one night in the life of Jack and Elsa. That's what was important, you know, and the other stuff 
we'll figure out whenever, you know, uh, if we're lucky. And 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 but ever, there was never a, a mandate to 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 make sure it slots in anywhere. So we'll just call it the Giacchino verse and we'll, we'll move on from that. <laughs> yeah, yes, um, I guess. <laughs> totally speaking, I mean, for this special, and, and you you guys cited the stuff that influenced you as kids, what you were going for in the creature double feature aspect. Um, there is a balance that always has to take place in something like this where it's it's scary and it's certainly you know spooky and a little gory at times, but it's also funny. It's also poignant. Uh, and comedy and horror are often siblings, you know, in the in the way that um, an audience interacts with them. Um, but I'd just like to know about how you two sort of discussed the balance of tone in this project. And you know, is it is it too goofy? Is it too funny? Is it not funny enough? Is it too scary? Where did it land for you guys? Well, there, there was a lot of too goofy stuff that you didn't see in the thing. <laughs> You know, there we, you know, there were some areas, where, some jokes that we took out because maybe it was a little too much. But uh, uh, I think, you know, Jeff has always said, you know, he has always, you know, we categorize. He's like, look, this we're not making a sadistic picture, right? And I and I always thought that that description was was right on when he said that. And I was like, no, we're not. And and the thing that we always focused on was the family and the heart of the characters. You know, like just this idea of treating them with enough respect to know that they're real people, treat them as real people and allow us to have those moments of levity and fun, but without discounting the fact that when something is scary, something's scary. Like I always hate it in movies when characters are like in the middle of a massive fight and they're doing all, but they're quipping these things to each other. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't feel real to me. You know, when, th when, when, when shit goes down, shit goes down and let them act as if shit's going down. And then when they, get out of it, yes, you can have a bit of relief and be happy that you didn't, you know, get lost in the gauntlet. But uh, it was, you know, and the other films we kept talking about were like films like Poltergeist, which I thought really threaded the needle in terms of, of, of just heart and humor and legitimate scares, you know. So, Jeff, you've worked on um, obviously a number, number of Marvel features, um, but also TV series like Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, you know, this is a special, but what is a special? Is it like a short feature? Is it long? Is it a long TV show? How did it feel to you in terms of the type of productions you've worked on in the past for Marvel? Well, I didn't approach it any differently, and I didn't approach anything. I've never really approached anything differently than anything else. A television miniseries or a TV series with six episodes. It's just a. It's just a film. It has a slightly different structure because of its length, and it has different rhythms, but I don't look at it like, oh, I've got to do this differently. Like, I just don't, it doesn't work that way. And this, we felt, we approached this as a feature film. This was a, this was a feature film. It happened to be short and it happened to be, but we, we, we shot it, we mixed it, we cut it. We did everything we would do if we, and we've screened it a bunch uh, in theaters and it plays great. It's like, it plays like a feature and people are kind of, <laughs> confused when it's not continuing but but it is it is i mean like it could it could you know a 90 minute horror film is was you know that's not an unusual thing so it's it's shy of that of course but but it is uh we didn't we didn't change that i think also just in terms of sound design and composition we assumed it was going to be you know people's we didn't like compensate for television for knowing it was going to be a streamer because we just thought of it as this the idea was that it was a found footage thing or a found object in other words there was a, there was a film that was made at some point in time, and Disney Plus is now airing it. That's sort of the idea behind yeah. it. Another, as opposed to saying you're curating this for the for the streaming service. Let's talk a little bit about the the films and shows that you're honoring in, in doing Werewolf by Night, and the style that you you know you are mimicking, for lack of a better word. And it starts right off. You have some fun with the Marvel opening uh, animation <laughs> logo kind of thing. Michael did it like a year ago. He Michael did that. Yeah, like, I mean, that's like I did that thing. was one of the first things I did, I, and I just cut that myself. Uh, yeah, he made that. You know, basically. he did it, and uh, you know, then of course, you know, they made it. We did a better version of it, but but I had that was one of the first things I sent to Kevin. It was just like, what do you think of this? And I just you know sent him that that opening Marvel logo with the with the scratches coming through and turning it into black and white. And suddenly there's like, uh, uh, it's a whole different version of that theme, just like in a minor key. And I thought that was really fun because, um, you know, talking about what, you know, the kinds of films we were referencing, we were obviously, you know, hearkening back to a lot of the universal films, which I loved. Um, and by the way, some of those are incredibly short, you know, they're not like, 
Yeah, very, very long short. movies, yeah. you know? Yeah. And even if you look at the original Frankenstein, I think it's like an hour. You know, it's not it's not that long. So uh, to go back into that world, to go back and and I felt like if we did this in black and white, it would help everyone understand that we were doing a thing not to not to take it too seriously and not to sit there wondering what the connections are to Doctor Strange and everything else. You know, I I thought we could kind of set a tone that would help the audience just sit back and watch something for once, as opposed to w- sitting back and worrying about watching something. Uh, because there's a lot going on in the Marvel universe. Well, and we also think it, 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 we wanted it to feel handmade and like it was, uh, you know, not something that was from a digital world. In other words, you right. know, there, are, there are digital effects, obviously, in the movie, but but we wanted it to feel like it wasn't that. And and because that's we see so much of it that it's like this is <laughs> this is different. But also it gives you that sense of it takes a lot of uh, things away from you when you do that. And that's what makes some of the horror work. It's like you don't have those things to fall back on. You don't have color. You don't have, you know, uh, 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 visual slick visual effects. It's all very much. It feels very grounded because of that in a weird way, because you've, you've removed those things. Well, is the look of Werewolf by Night all uh, in camera? Is it all in editorial? Is it a combo of the two? I, I would naturally assume, no, we shoot everything like we normally shoot things. And then we go nuts in the editing room and in visual effects. No. We didn't want to do that on this. I, 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 you know, one of the first things I said when this got going was all real sets. We need all real sets yep. without a doubt. I don't want a visual effects person out there with a stick and a tennis ball saying, hey, there's the monster. Look at the monster. I said, if there's a monster, we got to build a monster. And, and, and if we can't build like the final version of that monster, we need a physical representation of what that monster is at the very least, to show so that the actors had something to work off of. Uh, It's such hard work to do what they're doing and then to ask them to just pretend they see something in front of them. Like it's it's never quite right. But if that thing is in front of them, you believe them that much more, you know, uh, when they give their reaction. So that was really important to me. Real sets and as much in-camera stuff as we could do. And we did quite a bit. And as Jeff said, it's not like there's no digital effects. There are. And a lot of it is just sort of a veneer that help us smooth out some things. Uh, And there's also one great digital character that we had to do. But even that character uh, was represented on set with a guy in a in a in a in a man thing suit. You know, that was real. They had that was on set with us. So that was all very helpful. And I think it really went to to the to the point of um, making it feel right, you know, cutting off someone's arm. We had a fake arm just <laughs> land on the ground. Oh <laughs> but also, that you learn how to light it. You learn how to make it. You know what I mean? Like when you have the man thing, um, spoiler uh, character there. And, you know, we had him there, so we knew what he would look like when we lit him, and what it yeah. would look like in relation to Gael. So, like that stuff is valuable. You can take that to the visual effects, the digital world. But you learn that from from having a physical object. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the fun things you did to just sort of, again, be evocative of an old time, you know, universal monster picture. Um, of course, my favorite thing is the real changeover cues. <laughs> when did that idea come up? And and where did you actually, I kind of, you know, I'm a nerd, so I went and timed about when they actually happened and looked up like when, you know, what would be the runtime where the projectionist would have to change over. So what was the origin of that uh, great idea and what kind of rules or boundaries did you put around it? I mean, we, we just, we, we love that stuff. And anytime we could think of something that was like of that world, we would shove it in, you know, we wanted to do it. And, uh, and I remember Jeff made those himself at first, he, and put them in. And, uh, and it was funny because like, I guess some people might look at that and go, oh, that's a joke. But to us, it was not a joke. It was like, <laughs> no, this is, this is the way we remember seeing movies. Yeah, I mean, you know? I used to have to put, when I was editing on film, I was assistant on, and we were cutting on film before the, the incredible Avid, which we now just, it's the greatest thing I write in. But, uh, but, but before that, <laughs> there was this thing called film and, and a moviola. And I remember on work prints, I had to put those hash marks for changeovers on those on the, on the, on the work print. So, I mean, <laughs> it used to be my job. <laughs> but what's great about it, though, too, is it like, again, it, 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 it creates the sense that this is a, not a thing that was made now. Like, you know what I mean? It gives it that abstraction, I think. And, and we always thought about doing it. And in fact, those are those are correctly apportioned for where the real breaks would be if this were, you know, a three real show. 
And it was funny. It's so been so funny online to see the reaction to those. <laughs> people come every, with so many people are calling them out and and uh, giving it such love, and that's that's that feels really good. We also we also did a process where we took the the we graded the film um, and the the um, uh, the uh, the DI team at Marvel uh, Disney Plus Marvel was amazing, and they did this incredible look for us. You know, just getting it really in the pocket and then we took it in and went put it out to film and then recaptured that film it to inherit weave grain uh contrast aberrations and uh and some dirt which we didn't wanted not a lot but just enough and and that's so all that stuff's real that's that's a real in and out yeah. process to get the feeling of film and then we did a little trim pass but for the most part the the the, con the conception that they did really delivered for us you know, something in a, you know, in a werewolf movie, you have a werewolf, you know, spoiler alert, it's called Werewolf by Night, there's a werewolf <laughs> yes. on it. Um, but there's going to be a transition from man to werewolf. And that is always sort of the hallmark moment of any werewolf picture. Like, how are they going to handle well, the transformation? Yeah, Michael has to talk about that because that is something that was one of the very, very first things that, that. Yeah, that, that, that was something that, like, from the very beginning, uh, that shot was in my head. And. I wanted to figure out how do we do that practically, you know? Um, the other thing was, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of werewolf movies and monster movies. Like, I've seen every version of a werewolf transformation known to man. And I was thinking, like, we're not going to beat all of those. Like, how do, how do we beat all of those? And we can't. And what I feel about horror is the less you see, the more scared you are. You know, and the more you let your brain fill in all the blanks, you know, the more you let the sound work that the guys up at Skywalker did, which was incredible, you know, feed into your ears like that's going to be scarier and more terrifying than anything. If we just showed, you know, someone physically changing it right on camera. So I thought there's two parts to this. One is to say, OK, I just want to see it in shadow. I just want to see him do that in shadow. But the real trick to that shot is it's not really even about the werewolf. That shot's not about the werewolf. That's a, the shot is about Elsa. You know, here she is. She's come to this place. She wanted to write things in her life. She wanted to change things. She's done with her family. And she th thought she had a really good shot at doing this. And she ends up in a cage with a werewolf. And it's just like, you know what? This day has sucked. And <laughs> so for me, it's about, I wanted to see her face the whole time. And as you, that shot goes on, you see less and less of the werewolf transformation and more and more of Elsa. And, and, and again, you know, talking about story, and this is Jeff and I discuss this all the time. It's always about story and it's never about like, Oh, what looks cool on screen? You know, it's, it's like, well, what's the right thing for the story? And, and that shot was, um, uh, it was all about Elsa, and that was the right thing for the story at that moment. But it took a few months to 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 plan that shot out and get it right because that camera move. We had Laura Donnelly, who was brilliant, uh, on stage. She was there. The camera's moving towards her. The shadow is being projected behind her, you know, and it's all done in camera. The only thing not real in that shot are the bars, and the only reason they weren't there was because um, the parallax would have been wrong where the projector was sitting off to the side it was projecting and if we then the bars would have been projected there and the shadow it would have been a whole nightmare with the shadows that's the only thing we had to add later with the bars and we, we created this everything else and we created the yeah. shadow performance and then so that was that was built into the projection so that was a that yeah. was a pre pre-built playback yep. that would then occur in its form and we could continue to repeat the moves on laura yeah you, know, you were just telling me about how long that shot took to put, put took to put together, and I realized I didn't ask you at all about the length of this project and the, just the scope of it. Um, you know, all we talked about was just you two getting together and deciding you wanted to do it. When did you start Werewolf by Night, and, and when did you finish it? And for a fifty-two minute uh, feature, we'll call it. You know, how much, how many hours of footage do you recall working with? Uh, well, we started it about what a year, I mean, in earnest, I would say, was it a year and a half ago? in earnest, you know, in terms of like script being written maybe two years ago, um, because it was during the pandemic that a lot of this came together. Uh, actually, it was supposed to shoot earlier. It was supposed to shoot last summer, I think. And uh, then the pandemic happened and they were like, well, we're not allowed to hire anyone at, at this moment. We can't hire writers. They shut down everything, sent everyone home. And I was like, well, 
that's never going to get made. And I was like, you know, I thought, oh, well, nice try. It was the closest I'll get to making, you know, something. And uh, but then about a, f- a few months later, uh, Stephen Broussard, car- Stephen Broussard called me and said, um, hey, you still want to make this? We're, we're allowed to hire again. I was like, what? Really? OK. Uh, so it was pretty much throughout the most of the pandemic. And then, um, you know, and finished. We shot it in uh, what? March? March. Yeah. In April? Yeah. March and April. It was not a long shoot. It was very short. I can't remember how many Yeah. Days. I was in, you know, we were in Atlanta. I was in Atlanta two months uh, for prep and shooting. Uh, so it was a pretty quick turnaround, but really fast, uh, really fast. Yeah. Then there was not a lot. I mean, it was, it was first thought, best thought. We were shooting a lot of pages a day. It was, but it was great. Like that was part yeah. of the fun of it was, okay, we got this is five pages today and go. Yeah. And just, you, just, yeah. you can't be like, I wonder, hmm. no, 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 you gotta, no. You gotta go. <laughs> let's go. And so you had to, you had to go in prepared enough to know it, what you need it shot wise, yeah. what, what, what you absolutely need it. Like you couldn't just go in and depend on coverage. And I didn't want to do that anyway, because that's so, time, feels so yeah. generic to me. And so we really leaned into designed shots and, and designed sequences that we, that we held to as, as much as we could and, you know, improvised when we needed to, or when we wanted to. But we always went in with an idea of what was happening, you know, a story and I was storyboarded, you know, quite a bit. The whole thing was boarded. Jeffrey, did you edit on location or were you just dropping by that? No, day? I edited. I didn't. I was there for every setup. I think I was on set yeah. with my laptop and uh, and I just would cut as we went along. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was, so it was incredible. It was so incredible because the next day he would already have a cut of what we shot the previous day. And in some cases by that afternoon, he was cutting together certain things. So it was wonderful because he could come to me and he'd be like, I think we're going to need a shot of this. I think we're missing this particular thing. So before we moved on completely from that set, we were able to go and grab things that we, that we missed because we were moving at lightning pace. Well, it's also, it's and, also the tone. Like we were finding the tone. Every time you make a yeah. movie, um, the first few days are like, what is this movie? I'm learning yeah. to make the movie in the first three days. And you don't, in this, on our schedule, we could not afford to like reshoot our first three days. So when you're learning that stuff, the faster that we can figure out what the tone is and where to put people in terms of pitch, you know, how, how broad is it? You know, how serious is this? What are, who are these people to each other? That was one of the reasons why we needed to kind of like look at stuff quick because we were <laughs> the next day we were going to knock out another jump, big chunk of the movie. So we, we was going fast, but it yeah. was, it was a great, I loved it. I was, I was having so much fun though. Cause I got to be, I got to be right there and, and experience, you know, that all listening to Michael talk to the actors, listening to him collaborate with Gael and, and Laura and, and Harriet, like that stuff is so interesting to me because I normally don't get all that information i get it later the director will tell me but but to see it and like hear it while it's happening i'm like oh yeah okay well, if he wants that then i know i should do this and i should be here and it really helped me uh, do it so I, it's kind of it's kind of been like it, it was it was an eye-opening experience it was super fun but what it was great just I, literally in our chairs at video village he would be sitting next to me and he'd have the whole movie on his laptop and he would be cutting scenes as we were and it was just great to like and I'd, i would get distracted because i would be just like this is so cool i just want to watch this and the people would yell at me get, get over there and tell someone what to do <laughs> well jeff obviously you know the relationship you have with michael and just the fun nature of the project of course you're going to want to be there on set as much as you can but in general, you know, for a, for a large feature, if, if you could do it that way again, would you, would you prefer to be on set with your laptop or do you like sort of a little bit of distance on these larger projects? I'm doing it now on a feature. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the same thing. No, no, I'm, do, I'm, gonna, I'm doing it on the feature I'm on now. Yeah, we're going to do it again. I mean, it's, it's, it is just, I don't know. It, it is, I know there's a lot of editors who are like, I don't go to the set. I, we're gonna, and I, I can do that. I totally can do that. Um, but this is really filmmaking for me. Like it's really cool. And I, and if, if the directors don't kick me out, <laughs> then, then I'm, no, you know, I, I, it's great. I, I would be the opposite. <laughs> like I would never not want Jeff on set. Like there's, it's not possible. And because he's so the editing, yes, that's all great. And that's happening there, but he's also incredibly helpful in terms of just making sure you know, I was like with eye lines. I'm like, I, I, Jeff, come look at this. Tell me if this is right. And he would immediately go, yes, this is right. They should be looking there. You look there. Okay, great. Now I can. So he was helpful in, in a million ways beyond just 
cutting the movie. He was also someone that I could go to and, and bounce my ideas off of and go, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Is this right tonally? Does this feel good to you? You know, and that's that's invaluable to have people around you that won't bullshit you and won't just say, yeah, that sounds great. Like, that's not Jeff. And that's the that's the kind of person I need with me who will be just honest with me. And I know Jeff and I are always honest with each other, no matter what. Yeah, it goes, and, and it goes both ways, too, because I, I can't well, tell you how many times I've, I've sent, you know, I've attempt Q into something I've cut. Michael's scoring the movie, and he's like, what the hell is this? Like, I don't know. He's <laughs> like, no, we're not doing this. I'm like, okay, good. You're right, you're right, you're right. But I'm, I'm like, I, like, I trust him so much that it's like, if that happens, that, you know, it's like, that's the thing is you have that trust. It's like, you know, I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to let you do this because it's, I, look, I can do this better. But it's like that back and forth is something we learned over the years working as editor and composer on movies. So like that, yeah. that back and forth is something we already had. And it just translated so beautifully into what we were doing. And it was, and it allowed us to sit there and giggle and watch the screen together. Cause we both knew we were on the same page about what we were making. Well, I definitely want to talk more about the relationship or what it's like working with a director who is a composer. Um, but you just reminded me, Jeff, you know, doing temp score, when you're working with a composer, do you make a conscious effort to use something that they have done in the past or to specifically not use something they've ever done before? Well, it depends on the movie. Um, and it depends on whether I know who the composer is when I start the film. Obviously I did on this one. He was right there. Right. And, but the thing was, <laughs> the thing was also, we had this, we can talk a little bit about this, but this was another thing that was so fun on this movie, which was Michael was my music editor. So I would, he would supply me with raw material, right. And then I would cut it. And then he, but he'd continually, sometimes he'd cut it, but I mean, we would go back and forth, but he would be supplying me with this stuff because, and that was the way to do it on this because he's going to write it. And, it, and he understands that on a, like a, the DNA of the movie musically, why would I want, like, it's good to have ideas. It's not saying like it, music editors don't provide ideas, but in this case it was like, well, <laughs> this is how to, this is how to start building it because I can get him, his brain start he could start working on the ideas and then we'd get stuff demos and we'd start getting that stuff in and it would inform the cut. And then my cut would inform the score and we'd go back and forth and back and forth. And to have that sort of, you know, connection is really, really valuable. It's a, it's a luxury in this case. Cause you know, he yeah. was there. Well, the, one of the things they allow, you know, Jeff, we cut most of the movie here in my office. So he would be in the other office cutting and I, and then we'd be together going through that. And then I'd be like, okay, I'll be right back. I'm going to go write this cue. And I'd come over here and I'd either, <laughs> either write a new cue for something, or I would cut something together based on stuff that I had from previous. I was totally spoiled, movies. spoiled, spoiled, spoiled. And we could just, <laughs> and just bring it back in and we could throw it in. And it was so wonderful because we either, it either, it informed us in a lot of ways. Sometimes uh, I would look, I would write something and look at his cut and go, oh, I need to change what I wrote to to better hit what you just did because that's a better idea. Or sometimes he would adjust a cut to something I wrote. And it was just such a instant back and forth that we could just go run, you know, and it, it was such a, uh, a luxury, as he said, for sure. Michael, how is it possible for you to be the composer and the director on a project? That <laughs> seems like, I don't know, you, you kind of just sort of shed some light on it there. We're just, hey, wait right here. I'll be back in a minute. Um, but I know I don't get that. Like, how do you compose and direct at the same time? And, and just what, what's the, it sounds like it was a pretty nonlinear process, but if you could just tell me about how you tackled that. Um, yeah, problem. actually the composing happened throughout cutting. I mean, it was not like, it was great because I didn't, I wasn't waiting uh, for Jeff to do a cut and hand me the whole thing. And then I would do it. And then he'd have to wait for me to return stuff. It was all happening in real time. And, uh, and honestly, in the very beginning, I mean, I knew I would be OK doing it. But the one thing I was worried about was normally I have a director to to bounce ideas off of and to to kind of think about things and and say, maybe let's try this. Let's try that. And I worried that I didn't what I, I didn't have that on this, you know, but Jeff completely filled that role for, you know, in, in the best way possible in being the person that I could trust and throw things in front of and to give me honest feedback. Uh, and it was that, so that, that thing that I was worried about, I didn't even have to worry about it cause it was just such a real, uh, easy process between us. Um, but you know, how I, how it, I don't know. Uh, it just happens. I don't know. I like it. It's really fun, you know, and it's, it's like, you know, it's just a fun thing to do. And I never, I never thought about, even thought about 
having somebody else do it for me. Well, this, and and this, I, you know, this, but the skill set is this is is related. Uh, Matt, it's like, yeah. like he's really like when I have a score that working on him with a score and, you know, another director like Spider-Man No Way Home or something like that, the the score is storytelling. It, he's telling the story with music. So like his storytelling uh, instincts are very sharp because of his because that's how he tells with the story with music when he's composing. So, again, it's like those those two things aren't that far apart when you think about it, because that's how he thinks about it. That's how he thinks about the yeah. movie anyway. So it's sort of – and it's valuable because, boy, I, there's nothing better than a movie that tells the story visually and with music. I mean it's, a dialogue's great, but it's like movies are really at their best I think when they have that those moments where it's like the, it's a music and it's sound and it's texture and it's – all those things yeah. are coming together. And he's done that in so many projects. I mean that's, that's, his, that's his thing where it's just to make those moments. Well, Jeff, you said those skill sets are the same between composing and directing. Um, you know, here we have a very accomplished Oscar-winning – composer who's now a director you know michael was saying a lot of very nice things about your ability to sort of be a, another pair of eyes in the directing process you do you have any interest in directing uh, he'd at all? be great he would be amazing <laughs> he'd be great he should do it he'd be a great director i'd, I'd love to absolutely I, look, I, I, honestly i'd love to but it, it's also one of those things where my i'm a addict and my drug is filmmaking <laughs> and i need i need to do it and if I don't do it, I start to get the shakes kind of thing. And I've been able, fortunately, been the most lucky person on earth. I've been able to keep doing it. Like I've been able to make films. I mean, like working with Michael didn't feel, I didn't feel like I'm, you know, I'm just an editor here. I felt like I was no. a filmmaker and I, I always yeah. feel that way. Like I always, I always feel that way. So, and, and yeah. so for me, it's, it, it's not this one of those things where it's like, God, someday if I could just direct, uh, that's going to satisfy all these, these, you know, uh, um, things that I, I unresolved things that I want. Not to say that I wouldn't love to do it. I would absolutely love to do it. It's just been I've been busy cutting and it's been so fun. So, but I would love it. It's fun. Yeah. I, I I think filmmaking is the term. I think we we should use here too yeah. with like composing and editing because you know composing is editing, really. I mean, Michael will write a melody and then I watch him take that melody and move it around, take bits of it, break it down. He's just cutting up the thing he made and using it in different ways. And changing it slightly. Yeah. That's it's basically editing, but with me, I mean, it's, that's how he creates these incredible scores. And he has the gift of understanding where things go. And uh, when you when you cut something on the Avid and, and you put together a dialogue scene, it's the same thing. You, you have material. It's not like you have an unlimited amount of material, but you can put it together in an unlimited amount of ways. I think just editing is so much. It's directing's editing. The actor gives you an idea, and you go, "Nah, don't do that, but do this." That's an edit. Yeah. <laughs> you changed yeah. it before they did it. And so the idea of that's editing on set, I think why it was so so exciting was that we were we basically were still editing. We just had the actors there and they were helping yeah. us edit. And then, like Gael's amazing. You can give Gael a, a note and he'll come up with ten different amazing things to do with that note. And he'll give yeah. you an idea. So it's that collaboration that makes the thing more than what some of its parts. I think that's I think that's what we all kind of get into is that we're, we're just it's like like i said it's like, i guess the analogy would be like it being in a band it's like everybody's trying stuff and, yeah. and it all sounds like one thing but it's really the the work of a lot of different people i don't know i, I, talk. I think uh brad bird has said it many times he said uh you know filmmaking is the greatest group art form <laughs> yeah, on the planet because it has it, it uses every discipline in the art world that you can imagine every discipline is accounted for when you make a movie like that. And I, I think that's so true. And that and that and it's that group of people that you pull together that are actually making this movie, you know, and you're yeah. all doing it together. And it's it's such a fun experience. Well, Jeff, you talked about the accelerated pace, you know, doing five pages in a day, which is amazing. Um, and you also talked about um, just the, the actors giving you so much, you know, pretend he's not here. But how would you describe Michael's style of shooting and working with the actors do you get a lot of takes do you get and you know as much as you could in this environment is, is there a lot of improv that you're working with tell me about that well he he's really really good with actors and he's he they actors can tell when you're bullshitting them and they can tell when you're like trying to manipulate them because they're experts at behavior so you can't you, you really can't you know, manipulate an actor if they're good because they'll spot it and they don't want that and they don't like that. And he has none of that. He's got 0% of that. So so they trust him and they are really collaborative. And I think the thing that I uh, like the most about the way he works with them is that 
he has a process where he, you know, they rehearse and they go read through the scene. It's like they're involved in the creation of the scene. It's not as though they're being told what to do. They have to guess some sort of, you know, uh, weird plan that he's got in his head that they have to discern. It's not that he, he opens it up to them and, and allows them to talk and he listens. So I think that ability is something that I'm, I'm really, was really impressed by that because most directors have that and do that. Um, not all of them do it the same way. And some of them, um, you know, there's a lot of times there's struggles with actors where you're, you know, you're trying to get something from them as opposed to asking them what they can give to you. And I think that that's the way he approached it. And, and they really gave a lot to him because they trusted him and they saw how much he cared and how much, how important it was to him. And it was not, it's not an exercise about commerce or, or popularity or, or, uh, you know, streaming numbers. It was, he was, he really wanted to make this movie. I remember he sat them all down at one point at the beginning and said, okay, well, let's talk about what scared you as a kid. And they, and he, you know, they had that, just had them talk about like things that, that's, that they remember that scared them when they saw it in a movie. And, uh, and I thought that was like, that's so great. Like, what a great way to break the ice and bring them into the, what, what was exciting to him about it. So now all of a sudden you've got a whole team of people that are thinking in the same way. And again, it's, it levels tone and it creates it creates this relationship. But so he's very good with them. He does not shoot a lot of takes. We didn't have time to shoot a lot of takes, to be perfectly yeah. honest. But there were enough. And and also you don't need a lot of takes if you get the thing you need in the take. So and and if you're you know, if you can recognize that, then you don't have to go again. Because you go, oh, I got that piece. The rest of it's don't need it, but that one thing I needed, and there it is. You know, we talked earlier about um, where I asked about the the place of Werewolf by Night in the MCU, <laughs> and we we established it. It's it's all by itself in this little dusty corner, just this fun thing we did in the basement. Um, but it's still a Marvel project, yeah. and you know, fans, Marvel fans, are accustomed to looking, scrutinizing for those Easter eggs within a show. Within a show, they're fanatic about yeah. it. Um, that's why they're called fans. Mm-hmm. Um, they're there. For for example, there's a scene that takes place in a crypt. Um, is any good horror movie to have? <laughs> And I found myself really studying the names um, on the coffins, hoping to find something. I even asked my daughter who was watching with me. He's like, do you, do you see anything? You're the Marvel expert. What do you see here? So I couldn't find any. Um, and Jeff, I remember you talking about No Way Home. Um, John Watts gave you this guide to the Easter eggs in the films so that you could manage them accordingly. Was there anything like that at all for Werewolf by Night? I mean, there are plenty of <laughs> Easter eggs, but not the kind people are looking for. Like, for example, in that crypt, and this has been funny seeing people online trying to figure this out. There was a group of, there was two crypts that uh, where the people died on the same day. And they're all like, wait, what happened? That must be some big event. Those, those, the, and the truth of the matter is those two crypts are made up of names. So I, each name had three, you know, three names to it. So, and so they were all names. So that was basically the names from three different friends of mine on one and the names of three different friends of mine on the other. And those names, those people are people that I play this game called Fireball Island with. And it's a game from the 80s. And I play it every, you know, for, for a couple of years now, we've played it every Sunday. And uh, and we keep a log of who wins each game, you know, and who wins and what the date is that they won and how much they won by. And so when those two dates, the reason those two dates are the same, because that was one of the days that I won. <laughs> And, and beat them all. And uh, so that's, you know, it's not the sort of Marvel Easter egg people are looking for, but it's more personal stuff like that, you know? Like our kids' names are being sung by the choir, you know, uh, in the opening. So, you know, I mean, it's it's more personal stuff like that uh, we sort of stayed away from. Now, on the other side, some of the monster heads, if you really know what you're doing, there's a few of them there that are that are from the comics and from very specific either Werewolf by Night comics or or, you know, other other areas of the Marvel Universe. So that there, there is some stuff like that, too, for sure. But a lot of it is just us being ridiculous. <laughs> Clearly, I did not take you seriously enough when you said you guys were just having fun of being ridiculous. So <laughs> thank you for setting me straight on that. So within 52 minutes, um, you don't have much time to really get the machine rolling. You've got to set up the context. You've got to set up like, what's, what are we going after here? Um, and you do that in a pretty economical way at the beginning with, uh, with the voiceover and um, in the introduction of the characters. I just like to know, again, that's such a crucial part of getting the project off on the right foot. You know, how much energy went into that and how much you might've struggled with just getting that set up properly so that 
the audience audience could just get into enjoying being in the Jakino monster verse. I mean, that was I think that was the part of the movie we worked on the most in terms of like how many different versions there was of it, how many different, uh, you know, it, there were two scenes that we filmed that that used to be precede uh, the entrance into the rotunda. Uh, and uh, those were in, they were out. One was in, one was out, you know, like we tried almost every version of it to, in order to see what would work best. Um, and it all, it came down to feeling like, you know, that that sort of, again, Twilight Zone opening where, he, you know, part of the reason they're able to tell those stories in such an economical way is that they give you a bit of a, a heads up, up, up. Yeah. Up front. And he's telling you, this guy just did this and he's about to walk into this and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And and so in the end, that's what ended up being the most uh the the best way to tell the story and it you know and it was something that jeff and i we didn't let go easily of the other two scenes we kept trying to make them work because we felt like okay well it gives you an idea of who this person is and where, where he's headed but i uh, it turned out in the end that that information just no one we were the only ones to seem to care about well, well <laughs> so, the other thing the other thing that happened is when we tested the, the film early on the note that we kept getting, we kept get people be like, we love this, uh, but what? where does it fit into the Marvel world? We're confused. Yes. Everything has to fit. And where is this? And who are they? And where is it? Where are the Avengers? I mean, yeah. it's like, okay. <laughs> and we're kind of like, uh, okay, we need to tell them. We need to literally go, hi, um, this doesn't have anything to do with any of those other characters, but you're going to love it anyway. So don't worry about it. Yeah. And Michael came up with this great idea, which was let's show the Avengers and then pan off them and say, nope. <laughs> and literally visually and, the, and, and literally the very narration is saying the, the Marvel universe. Well, where are, where's the darkness? And it basically just, <laughs> do you not worry about this? You're going to be yes. fine. And it, it, that really helped us because it allowed you to not to start processing it as like, I don't have to do any homework. This is a fresh thing. I'm good. And then you could listen. Well, it shouldn't be any surprise that you know, a movie, a feature that is uh, directed by a composer, you're going to have a lot of fun with sound. And up, <laughs> up to this point, we've really only talked about score in that aspect. But there's so much fun stuff going on with sound, uh, just the sound design of, of Bloodstone's voice with this sort of warped <laughs> tape kind of thing. The voiceover starting kind of uh, distorted and then it gets clearer. And I just wanted to hear about some of the decision making that went into those two things in particular. We, well, this, we, well, first of all, I got to say, we had... <laughs> Like this insane dream team on this thing. We had, I'm, I just have to brag because it's like, I'm like, these are my, these are people who are my heroes. Like, it's like people I just yeah. worship. So we had um, Shannon Mills, who's done a bunch of work with me. We had Josh Gold, who pretty much ran the whole thing and supervised all the great design. He's really the guy that we have to thank for mm -hmm. a lot of it. We had Juan Peralta, Michael Savannah <laughs> mixing, and Gary Ratstrom set and did some design for it. So it was like, it's like, what? <laughs> these were all, you know, pretty all good. these guys were people that I had worked with before, especially Juan and, and Michael and, and Gary Rydstrom. And I just, you know, I'm making this movie. I'm like, guys, do you want to do this with me? I'm like, you know, because I know them as friends. I've worked with them on a million things. And I'm not thinking about the idea that, oh, all the other things going on. They don't get Gary Rydstrom, or they don't get, you know, and I, I didn't think of it that way, but I was so thankful that he was like, sure, I'll help out however you want. And and then of course, Juan, Juan Peralta, I've known him since like the Incredibles days. And I, I, you know, to see him grow up in this business and do what he's doing now is incredible. Michael Semantic's been on almost every movie I've, I've done up there. I mean, it's it's it was an embarrassment of riches. It's crazy. And then you have Josh and you have Chris Gridley, who was amazing on on ADR, yeah, he's uh, incredible. dialogue, uh, and he's the one who really made that that voice that you talked about. He made that warp. He made that work and sound the way it did, which was great. Yeah. And uh, you know that team was just incredible. And again, we just had a lot of fun with them too. You know, um, and you know it's not like a feature where you get weeks and weeks and weeks to do something. And we, we had to do it move fast. And we mixed it with them. We we were there. Like I knew that was going to be something early on. I said to, to Marvel, I'm like, you know, Michael is not going to want to listen to playbacks. He's going to need to be in the room. We got he's a that's how it works. And just because he's so sonically, you know, and it's his score and it's going to be balancing that. It's going to be something we need to hear. And we, so we work yeah. together, which is not always the case in, in television stuff. I mean, you don't always have the opportunity to sit in because the schedules are rushed. But we carved out a little bit of time for that and said, we want to we want to make sure we protect that because it 
it, it, and it, it, it had, it was so great to be able to do that, you know, yeah. and to be there and, and collaborate with them. It's the same thing we talked about on set. It's like, you know, uh, Josh Gold is, is a sound editor I've worked with on a bunch of the Marvel films and, and he just did incredible work on this. And it was like, you give him an idea, he goes off, he tries it, he comes back on the stage and there it is. That was that process we did even yeah. in post. I mean, you know, and, and we were, we were, we wanted this to feel like it was a feature movie, yeah. you know, and, and in order to do that, you, you know, you can't skip on some of those steps. You have to be there. You have to. And we, so we were up there for a week at Skywalker with them every day. And it was just, uh, you know, it's and it felt so like fun. the right way to do it. It's yeah, great. It was great. Well, along those same lines, I mean, you had a lot of fun with surround sound. I mean, a lot of the story takes place in a maze. <laughs> And as the characters are working through the maze, you're hearing sounds in the distance. You're hearing the flaming tuba go off. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned that you guys were working, Michael, at your place. So, Jeff, did you have some kind of surround setup for your avid there? Or did you just go pretty bare bones? No, no, no. I, I cut in 5-1. I had an editing room at Disney and then one at Michael's office. We kind of, depending on when, when we, where we were, what we were doing, because sometimes we had to be close to DI. But, um, yeah, I just had a, a simple 5-1 setup. And I do a pretty elaborate track while I'm working, and I knew that I would need to be really on top of mixing because it's again, it's it's handing off the music and keeping that, making sure that the score and and the and the rest of the style of the sound design, it all has to feel like of a piece. And I knew that he was going to be very critical, and I'm very critical about that stuff too. And I love doing it, so I really spent a lot of time on the track. And we did work in five one, knowing that even though you know some people will be hearing it in different formats, and we were careful to do that, but we mixed it. We did a feature mix in a in a feature room, and then and then and then contained it for for near field. We didn't start with near field. We actually we did it big. You know, before we wrap up on sound, if I don't ask this, I'm going to regret it. Uh, you know, careful viewers of Werewolf by Night, those that stay through the credits and really scrutinize every name, will notice a credit for additional man thing vocalizations. Jeffrey Ford. <laughs> uh, okay, here's Jeff. <laughs> this was a stroke of genius and it was because uh, we were struggling and I, I was like, it's not sounding like he, they're talking to each other. And yet it's 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 so the sounds were very cool, but we needed it to be conversational. We needed it to feel like, you know, friends were talking to each other. And, and Jeff was basically like, just leave the room. Go leave the room. I'm going to do something. Go I don't want you watching me do this. You have to leave. I'm like, but I want to stay and watch this. I want to. He was like, no, got to go. So I was like, OK. So I left the room and I, I uh, we were up at Skywalker during this part. And I left the room, went back to the stage, was on stage. So he calls me back a little while later and he goes, OK. This is just just, you know, me messing around. But but he recorded himself saying things to Jack, like, give, give you know, it, Jack is responding to man thing. And and Jeff filled in the blanks and was basically saying, like, really, I don't trust that you're going to help me or, blah, 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 blah. or she's not rich. I don't think she's into dogs. You know, this kind of <laughs> stuff like there was like all of these kinds of crazy things he was saying that made it feel conversational. But he took that those words and then pitched it as far down as it could go. So it became unrecognizable to what it was he was saying. Uh, but the end result, after then Josh would mix in the things that he had too, along with what Jeff did, the end result made it feel 100% conversational. Like two friends just like, blah, being upset with each other or not trusting each other or <laughs> making fun of each other. Like that came through in such a huge way. And uh, and I was like, Jeff, we got, we got to put you in the credits. This has to be, he's like, no, I don't want, no, no, no. I'm like, no, we're we're doing this. <laughs> it has to be, <laughs> but it, it, it helped in an enormous way. Just bring that character to the life, to life in a way, which we, we didn't have at the time. Just leave me alone. I need to do something weird by myself. <laughs> yes. um, so, so many jokes, so little time. I need to meet um, them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, um, I know you guys are both very busy with major motion pictures and with parents. Um, so I just have a couple more I'd like to get to before we sure. go. And Michael, for you, uh, obviously you've worked with a lot of very talented directors. Anything that you've learned from any of them in particular that you brought with you to Werewolf by Night, where you said, listen, I'm going to make sure you made a note at some point in your past, like, that's how I'm going to do it when I'm doing this. You know what? I had them screaming in my head the entire time <laughs> I was shooting. They were all of them, you know, Matt Reeves, J.J. Abrams, Brad Bird, uh, you know, uh, all of these people were just like uh, hounding me in my head. But I, I, I think I've spent so much time with them, both on and off set over the years. And I love going to set and watching each of them work. And they each have their own way of doing things. And it was just sort of, I think, years of absorbing 
all of that. And then it allowed me to feel comfortable on set. I never felt like I was not up to the task or I was nervous. Of course, you're, you're not sure how things are going to work out. And there's a, a certain amount of fear is good for you. And, and I, I want that. But I didn't feel out of place, as I guess is what I'm saying. I felt I had learned so much from them uh, over the years that it was just very helpful. And, you know, and then sometimes I'd be like, if I want it, I want it to feel something visceral. That was like JJ saying something to me in my head. You know, if I wanted to, like, take my time with something that was Matt Reeves telling me, take your time, you know. And and it was really and, 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 if, and if I wanted something really sort of like smartly said or, 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 or sort of a choreographed move at the camera. That was Brad Bird yelling at me. And it was just, you know, there were all of these moments that really felt like um, they had just taught me over the years without even knowing they were teaching me. The way we grew up watching movies, we were being taught by, you know, all these amazing filmmakers, whether it was, you know, Spielberg or Dante or whoever it was, like we, we you know, you just absorb it as you grow up. And I felt like that's so much of what happened to me over the last 20 years working with all of these great people. And Jeff, for you, it seems like every project you do, you come up with some sort of new process or technique that you employ. Was there anything from Werewolf by Night where you tried a new method or where you improved upon a method you might have done on the previous project like No Way Home? Well, I think, you know, uh, Robin Badai is my, my first assistant. He's incredible. Like, you know, this is the best there is. And and he always can come up with ways to make these things work when I ask him for crazy stuff. And the onset thing was the trick on this one because it ne I needed to get material into the computer and back, back and forth because obviously I had to have it. I couldn't just have everything on my laptop, but we had to have a system for moving media around and stuff and, and make it so that it was simple. And, and I didn't have a lot to spend a lot of time thinking about it because it has to be kind of fast. You have to be able to kind of move quickly uh, day to day. So that I think was the big, that was the big revolution on this one was to try to figure out a way to do that. And we did, and now we're going to apply it in the future. But um, I think also too, that the idea that, um, uh, you don't really have to be like part of the process is cutting the thing while you're, you know, you do a ref edit of the thing, then you can sit down in the room and really refine it. But that initial cut, you can do it. You don't have to get so you can, you can really take your time and, and listen and, and do stuff uh, on set on a laptop, get that laid out, get a sense of it, and then really start working it. And I think that I always would sit down and I got to be in the room and I got to go through every little bit of dailies. Well, you do, but you can also, you can do it. You can do a, a, a first pass. Uh, portably, and, and and it's really interesting. So I th I think we've talked about everything possible, <laughs> other than uh, you know Jeff, what's it like to work with a director who can transpose the score for an alto sax? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Which was the thing I hated doing most in school. I remember right, learning to write for saxophone. I hated it because they each had their own clef, and I was just like, oh my. God. God, now that's a horror story. And I was just like, <laughs> thank God when I started working in Sibelius, because then I didn't have to like deal with that anymore. And I was just, you know, sort of like, now I can just do the thing. But yeah. Michael, how do you transpose for a flaming tuba? Uh, well, it's, it's, it, you don't, you don't have to, it's in C. So it all works out great. <laughs> be flat, you know, depending on the tuba. It's all, it's all about usually, the roof. You know, be, be flat or whatever. You just, just, just write it. Oh, it's all about and the in room. that case, you know, <laughs> David Silverman. Now, David Silverman played that tuba, and David Silverman is uh, a legend uh, in the animation world. He was the very first hire on The Simpsons, and he has been one of their producers, directors, and uh, consultants since day one on that show, and he's still on the show, and he's just like this incredible, incredible talent. And he is a... Um, you know, he plays tuba. He loves playing jazz. He loves playing New Orleans jazz and all kinds of stuff. He has this an unbelievable memory for classical music. He knows every single piece ever written. He can tell you it's it's phenomenal. You know, it's scary. And uh, but he's just an incredible guy. So he's a good friend of mine. And I was like, I think there's a way to put this tuba in this thing and make it cool. <laughs> you made it cool um, and you certainly made this interview cool I mean all I can say is I, I hope you guys have more fun in your next project <laughs> uh, yeah we're gonna, we're try. gonna do it <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a goal <laughs>